So two weeks ago, I got a chance to go to a concert. And it wasn't just any concert. It was a concert for the, from a band that I had been listening to since I was in high school. And the occasion for this tour that they were on was actually to celebrate the 25th anniversary of a specific album. I listened to that album when I was in high school. It was this one, something to write home about. I'm a, like, I don't know how I felt about that, that I'm old enough to listen to a band playing a 25th anniversary concert. Felt a little bit weird to me. But this album, it's a fantastic album uh, for that genre of music. It's really well known. But uh, it meant a lot to me. There's a lot of songs on there that I, I have moments that I remember. In fact, here's one of them right now. My wife and I used to listen to this band a lot. And so this song is actually not from this recording. This is an arrangement of a song from this album that we had played at our wedding. And this is actually the recording of the moment where my wife, Margaret, was walking down the aisle. Great memory for me. This, this album has tons of memories like that. Do you, have, do you have soundtracks like that for you? Albums, songs, moments in history that are tied together with the songs. And whenever you hear that album, you just are taken back to that moment. Well, this band was known from being kind of emotionally vulnerable. And so in that season of life, there was a lot of songs that resonated with me. They were kind of like my Taylor Swift. But, you know, this song itself is, may, might make me a bit emotional. So we should probably kill it right now. Thank you. But they were great. They weren't, they weren't much older than I was. So everything that they were singing about were things that I was going through when they were talking about it. And it was that late teen stage of life. And so you might remember that stage of life, or maybe you're in that stage of life right now, where everything feels like it's the first time it really matters. And it actually might last forever. So for school, you feel like, okay, the grades might not have been important before, but now they I might actually change my career. I need to actually start caring now. At least I did. Romance, or lack thereof. All of a sudden, it felt like it had a connection to, well, maybe this might last forever. How wrong I was. <laughs> and friendships. Friendships, are those are the friendships that sometimes you can go back to, and they're the ones that last. Or sometimes those are the ones that end when you don't expect them to end. And that happened to me. I had a friendship end in that season, like I was fired from that friendship. It was sudden. So how did I process it? Oh, this album was so good. <laughs> I remember actually driving in the car, and I didn't even plan it. That song just came on. Maybe I was listening to the album. And uh, I remember how much those lyrics in that song resonated with what I was going through in that moment. Here's some of the lyrics. We're loyal, like brothers. Just us versus all the others. You're the one for, you're the one for me. I trusted, misleading, promises worth repeating. How could you do this to me? Oh, oh, can you feel the, the emotions? <laughs> I felt them. Uh, tears were coming down my face. I was uh, yelling more than singing at that point. And I had barely gotten my G2. Like, I should not have been driving in those circumstances. I apologize to anyone who was on the road with me that day. I was, in that moment, I was definitely being bullied by loneliness. And if you've, ever, if you've lived life long enough, you've experienced that. You had to have. Loneliness bully shows up in friendships often because there are so many ways to mistreat each other, right? I mean, you've probably experienced a variety of them. I actually found this list from a journal of 55 different reasons people end relationships. We just tuck them in there tidily onto one page for you. <laughs> Let me share with you just a couple of them. There's the very, very dull ones, like we do not have a good time together. Or the practical one, we live far away from each other. That's understandable. But then there's the juicy ones. My friend betrayed my trust. 
My friend does not accept my choices. My friend only looks out for their own interest. And you, you might be thinking with me right now that like with 55 different ways to end friendships and some of the pain that we even just feel thinking about this, are friendships even worth the effort? Maybe you're in the middle of experiencing one of those 55 ways someone's mistreating you right now. Whenever that loneliness bully shows up, we have no choice. We have to face it. Now, we're going to end today's gathering in communion. And so if you're joining us online, I'd encourage you to grab something to eat, something to drink, so you can participate with us. But Jesus taught his followers this practice of communion at his last meal with them, right before he was going to face the loneliness bully himself, and everything was going south for him. He was just hours away from being arrested, put on trial, and executed. And Jesus probably experienced most of those 55 reasons to end a friendship in about three to four hours, and from his 12 closest friends. So we're going to pick up the account from Matthew um, as he tells the story of what happened right after that meal. And Jesus and his closest friends left the place where they ate and they walked to a nearby garden on the mountain of Olives. And as we read this text, I'm going to encourage you to pay attention to Jesus' closest friends and how they are supportive of him in his time of need. So it started off here. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee, two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. That's pretty aggressive. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. That's pretty vulnerable. Simple request, stay here and keep watch with me. So he went on a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. So what happens when he returns to his disciples? When he returns to his disciples, he finds them asleep. He said, Peter, can't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And then it starts to get a little repetitive here. Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this, cup were, if, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them, he found them sleeping again, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. This time he doesn't even bother waking them up. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of his own, one of the 12 disciples arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and the elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him the kiss. And Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. And Jesus said to the crowd, am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come to me with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. Well, if there's nothing else you get out of coming to church on Thanksgiving, I hope you feel better about your friends 
because they probably uh, have done better things to you than the disciples did to Jesus recently. And as uncomfortably disappointing as they are for us to watch, Jesus' friends provide a backdrop for us to see exactly how Jesus handles the loneliness bully. And the longer you live, the more chances you have to face that bully. And I certainly want to get better at facing him. I mean, crying to my soundtrack of the Get Up Kids is only going to take me so far. I need to get better. So if you had a chance to sit down and read this portion of scripture a few times, you probably notice a repeating phrase, an idea that Jesus keeps using. It seems as though Jesus had his own soundtrack that he was tapping into. You can see it in this last paragraph here. This is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. The scriptures. There's not much dialogue between Jesus and those who are around him between his, his uh, final meal all the way to his arrest. But three times he provides context by saying this is what the scriptures were pointing to. Particularly when he's referencing how his friends are going to betray him or desert him. The long sweeping melody of scripture was the soundtrack that Jesus was tuned into. But this was a steadfast practice. Jesus was determined to stay focused on that melody. And that gave him connection to his mission. So Jesus' soundtrack really gave him meaning for what he faced, and gave him purpose for how he treated others. We're going to look at both of those. Just a second here, Matt. It might seem pretty obvious. Uh, You know, Jesus is God in human flesh. He's the one that all scripture points to. He, of course, is very well versed in the Hebrew scriptures. Yes, Jesus' knowledge of the scriptures is very great. But there's some cultural reference to that. In the, in the age that he was growing up in, both him and the author that we've been reading from, Matthew, both grew up in a Jewish context. And in that context, it was normal to spend the formative years of education studying scripture. In fact, especially for young men who had more access to education, it was normal for them to have large chunks of scripture absolutely memorized, something that we would find just amazing today. Most scholars agree too that Matthew's actually writing to a Jewish audience. So it's not just that he's writing from a Jewish perspective, but he's expecting his listeners to be able to listen to the same types of techniques and cues that he grew up experiencing. And he's not just using these techniques to be clever. When Matthew references something, it's because he's trying to transmit something that he think is, thinks is important, that gave a deep meaning for Jesus for what he faced. Now, one thing that helps us here is keeping in mind that writing anything was expensive. You had to pay for a scribe. You had to pay for the materials to write. It's not the same thing for us today. You couldn't just write anything. So every word that Matthew writes has a cost to it, and he is efficient with his words. So when he mentions something that happened, or even specifically the location that it happens, it's something for us to keep keep track of, to pay attention to. There's a specific note that he's playing in the soundtrack. So why does Matthew mention the Mount of Olives in verse 30? This is just before the section that we read. It says, Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. By mentioning it, Matthew is tapping into a repeated melody in the Hebrew Scriptures that connects to mountains. And it was completely reasonable For that small reference, which seems insignificant to us, to actually trigger for his audience, for his listeners, those who were well-versed in scripture, a whole host of stories that were connected to mountains. Here's just a handful of them. Mount Sinai, where the people of Israel encountered Yahweh, and they were given the 12 commandments. Mount Horeb, where Moses encountered the burning bush. Mount Carmel, where the prophet Elijah had the showdown between himself and the prophets of Baal. Abraham and Isaac experienced God's provision on a mountaintop in Moriah, saving Isaac's life. 
And then the first mountain ever mentioned happens to be the Garden of Eden. And that one is significant. If you get a chance to read these stories next to each other or one after the other, you would definitely start noticing some fascinating patterns start to jump out at you. One of those things that is common for all these stories is that mountains are places of encounter. God shows up in all of these stories on mountains. It's kind of intuitive. As you head towards the mountains, you leave behind the cities and towns and places where people are. And you go to the places where you're exposed to the elements, where there's nowhere to hide and nowhere to hide from God. Jesus was known for heading up to mountains to pray. He was tapping into that. And as he was heading into the Mount of Olives, he was heading towards the place of encounter. That's what he needed. In the final hours of his greatest trial, he is looking for encounter. He's tapping into his soundtrack to find meaning for this moment. Mountains are places of encounter, <clears throat> but they're also places of testing. And I'm not talking about exams. Each mountain story that we, we heard about just, just before are also a place where the story, the characters experience some type of test. A test of character. An opportunity to show whether you fully buy into God's definition of good and evil or you find it too enticing to choose what seems good to you. And for Jesus, on the Mount of Olives, he has a choice before him. Will he trust his father as he is being led toward a brutal, isolating, and harrowing experience? Or will he choose another way, a way out? When Jesus prays, he shows by the words that he uses that he knows he's in the test. He knows he's in that moment. He recognizes the melody, but he rises to the occasion. His prayer is, I want your will to be done, not mine. Now, wouldn't you love it if you could wake up in the morning, you pull out your phone, and you could see on your phone an alert, at 10.30 this morning, you will be tested. Wouldn't that be kind of helpful knowing in advance that you're going into it? Now, I don't know, maybe some of you have appointments that you know going into that appointment with the people there that you will be tested. But for, for us, we don't have the same type of awareness that Jesus seems to have. He's so dialed into that moment. He seems to know exactly where he is. It's like he got a heads up text. I, I relate a lot more to his followers. They seem so lost in the moment, disconnected, distracted, and asleep to the critical moment that's happening right in front of them. But Jesus didn't just get connected to this moment because it was an intense moment. This was a practice that he had developed his entire life. He found meaning by tapping into the soundtrack because it was inseparable from who he was. He knew that the larger narrative of scripture was pointing to him. It was giving meaning to his life. And every event that took place and every place that he chose to be were tied in intentionally to that greater plan. Jesus' soundtrack was epic. The plight of humanity was in his hands. And as weighty as that moment is, his understanding of his role gives him the meaning to face it. He knew his choices fit into a greater melody. And he was given the meaning he needed for what he faced. So with all that weight that he's carrying, it's amazing that he even could pay attention to the people around him. But he didn't just do that. Jesus' soundtrack provided him a purpose for how he treated others. He was the one being betrayed. He was the one being neglected, slandered, and deserted. No friend stood alongside him. Nobody was brave enough to stand up for the truth beside him. No one was going through the ringer, and yet he was watching out for the others, even those who were hurting him. I, I, I thought about it this way. Jesus treated everybody like there would be some type of relationship still 
after this crisis. He wasn't just focused on winning that moment or being present to that moment, but present to that relationship. He, this is even his process with Judas. Judas is world famous for his betrayal. Nobody mistreated Jesus like Judas did. Even Matthew, I don't know if you caught it before when we were reading through the scripture. Matthew can't help but slide in the title of traitor when he, when he brings up Judas. His actions alone could tick off, I don't know, like half of that list of 55 ways that someone could make you want to end your relationship. Get this. Okay, this is just some of what he did. He snuck off to the leaders that wanted Jesus to be dealt with. This was premeditated. He approached them. And he had already received payment for, for his participation in getting Jesus captured. And he still had the guts to show up for dinner. Now, uh, like imagine that at your Thanksgiving dinner. Someone showing up, having the guts to show up like that. Now, now side note, if you do have someone showing up <laughs> for your Thanksgiving dinner, and they're, they're treating you that way, uh, you probably should consider some serious action <laughs> uh, on that friendship. But Matthew records Jesus' interactions with Judas. Let's, let's read it actually from Matthew uh, here. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked him in turn, am I the one, Lord? He replied, one of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die again, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, you have said it. I don't know whether someone tipped him off or whether he had some like supernatural knowledge in that moment, but Jesus knows what Judas is about to do. This is his last moment to face Judas before he goes through with it. How would you handle someone who you know is about to betray you and they're hiding it. How would you handle someone that you know and you've loved and you've lived life with and they're about to betray themselves? The most loving thing that Jesus can do is share with them the potential consequences for what he's about to do. To help you to face the consequences for the choices that he's making in that moment. But in a subtle move from Matthew here, it actually shows us that Jesus, Judas's heart just wasn't there. When Jesus brings up the betrayal, he brings it up twice. I don't know if you noticed that. The first time, all the disciples say, am I the one, Lord? But then the second time when he brings it up, then Judas responds, Rabbi, am I the one? The disciples are willing to call Jesus Lord, because they're actually willing to follow him, to make the choices of Jesus their choices, but not Judas. Even with that direct and loving call out from G Jesus, Judas can only bring himself to call him rabbi. It's a respectful term, but it's a distant term, a clear distinction that keeps Jesus at arm length. Judas just can't let go of control in that moment. As we pointed out earlier, yet Jesus finds himself in that moment understanding that this is all tied into scripture. For the son of man must die, just as the scriptures say. The next time Jesus meets Judas, it's when he's leading a band of armed thugs to arrest him. Even then, as painful as it would have been to be betrayed and betrayed by a loving gesture of familiarity and closeness, oh, that would have felt awful. A kiss on the cheek. Jesus' words are gentle and non-reactive. My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Jesus was non-reactive to Judas, but he was non-reactive to everyone in that season. 
He's gentle instead of angry with the disciples who can't meet his request just to stay awake and then when they run away from his arrest. He's silent in front of slander at the secret trial, not defensive. And to the religious leaders, he takes the risk to speak with conviction and honesty about himself, refusing to be intimidated. Jesus was not depending on anyone else to get it right for him to stay the course. That's so different from me. I expect everyone to have the right motives. I expect them to do the right thing. And when they don't, I get surprised. And I, that's usually when I lose it. But it seems he was expecting to face the bully of loneliness in every interaction. And he really does end up standing alone. Now, what if you're motivated today, hearing all this and seeing the way of Jesus? What, what makes you feel you can actually do that? I mean, if you're really honest with yourself, you know that even if you really want to, we can't live like that. <laughs> we know too many people. They treat us too many different ways. There's too many ways we are bullied by loneliness. And how are we supposed to lean towards what has caused us pain in the past anyway? Or if we've opening ourselves up to people, it leaves us vulnerable to pain in the future. Or maybe the last time a friendship ended, maybe it was because of us. Somehow Jesus thinks it's possible. His teachings clearly expected his followers to pattern their lives after him. He calls us to be the non-reactive presence that resembles him, to face down the bully of loneliness by walking towards others, even to treat others in a way, just like him, that it will be more possible to rebuild relationship on the other side of crisis. Not operating from pride, with defensiveness or anger, not operating from fear, by hiding or posturing. Man, we would need some seriously epic soundtrack to help us get there. And I've been saving part of the story that just might help us out. I don't know if you noticed, but the only time that Jesus seems to have lost his composure was when he was praying. Prayer seems to be the safest place for Jesus to be completely honest. He openly showed his desire to not go through with the plan in his prayers, to avoid the pain and suffering. And the next time we see Jesus pray, is the next time we see Jesus emotionally ragged in his last words. After hanging on the cross for three hours, he shouts toward the sky, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now, would you be surprised if I told you he was quoting scripture there? Even in that moment, this is the opening line to Psalm 22. A psalm that gave Jesus words to pray when he didn't have any left. Psalm 22 goes on to say, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Now the psalmist might have been feeling that way. But Jesus was experiencing something completely different. As he takes his last ragged breath, the soundtrack that had been carrying him through his final day falls to its lowest. Jesus hears no answer. There was no friend or follower that stood with him before. And in this moment, there's no father, there's no dove, there's no voice from heaven. Jesus experiences complete separation from God and from man. And he becomes the only one to have faced complete loneliness. But as one soundtrack was winding down, another one had just begun. A soundtrack was started the night before at the meal with Jesus and his followers. Now, it's worth mentioning right now, if you, if you feel like you're being bullied by loneliness right now, 
The safest place for you to be brutally honest is alongside Jesus in prayer. Be honest with your father. He can take it. And if you're at a loss for words, if you need to borrow someone else's, borrow the words from Psalm 22. But when it feels like there's no soundtrack that's epic enough to carry us, we have to remember this. This is what Jesus went through for us. And what he went through for us is a soundtrack that could stand toe-to-toe with any loneliness that we experience. Jesus experienced this depth of being alone so that we don't have to. Nothing can separate us from the love of our Father because of what Jesus did. And he did it because he loves us. And one of the best things we can do is let ourselves be loved by him. And that is the soundtrack that leads us to live like him. This soundtrack is an invitation to a table. A table that calls us to be honest when we can't try enough on our own to get things right. This table calls us to realize that our strength to live like Jesus comes from being loved from him. It pulls us to love other people around the table just like Jesus loves them. This is an invitation for anyone who wants to call Jesus more than just a rabbi, but a Lord. To anyone who is willing to choose Jesus' way, even if it's right now, for first time. So I want to invite us right now for anyone who would call Jesus Lord to come to the table of communion. If you have emblems with you right now, you can pull them out. If you're watching online, you can grab them. This table is a table where we meet with God, but it's a table also where we meet with people. People that could hurt us. People that we could hurt. In that sense, it's like any other table. And as we sit with that, at, at this table, we bring to it what we bring to every other table, our mistakes and our flaws. The gaps of what we don't understand as well as the things that we understand imperfectly. The difference for us is what is sitting on the table. Simple elements of bread and wine. They speak of a son who is led up on a hill, a mountain. And there, instead of encountering his father, he was broken. So that here at the table, we can be put back together. Us with ourselves. Us with each other. And us with God. And there, in that mountain of testing, Jesus drank the cup of suffering without failing so that here at the table, we can experience his close presence, one that will empower us to live like him. So I invite you to participate in communion with us now as we read from the words from Matthew. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it for it is my body. Let's take the bread together. And he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Let's take the cup together. Before we leave today, our music team is going to sing a song for us that echoes some of the themes of the soundtrack, reminding us of how good God has always been. And it's going to lead us to a response of gratitude so appropriate for Thanksgiving. I hope at this table, in this song, you'll find meaning to what you face and purpose for, what, for how you will be treating people. But I also want to invite you to bring your own relationships in this moment. And uh, maybe just before we sing, can I pray? Let's pray. 
Jesus, thank you for what you went through. The loneliness that you endured so that we would never have to experience that. And God, we pray right now for those who are walking through a season of loneliness, God. We look to your promise, Jesus, that you put the lonely in families. Help them find a family here, God, with us. And help us be a family worth having, Jesus. And God, for people who've been in relationships and seasons where they've been hurt by relationships, would you bind up the brokenhearted? Would you bring healing to them today? And God, for those who are in the middle of facing tough relationships, maybe even today at lunch, the Thanksgiving meals that we're going to be having. God, give us the strength so that we can love the way that you did. Help us respond to you, not to those around the table. And God, for those who have unfortunately made damage in relationships in the past, God, we see we're invited to the table still. You've given us second chances. Help us accept your grace and your forgiveness. Help us step into this moment. Thank you for your second chance. Pray this in your name. Amen.